Um, I'm Paul Coyer. I'm a research professor here. Um, so uh, we are, a lot of people assume we're a think tank. As you two know, we're not. We're actually a graduate school, uh, although we do think here most of the time. Um, but we do, uh, we have five different master's degrees, 18 one-year certificates, and just started a doctoral program in national security last year. Um, Dr. Ellis is, a uh, uh, few people I should say, to start with, really focus on the strategic importance of Latin America, I think. Uh, it's always sexier to focus on Russia, China, the Middle East, and those are big concerns. But Latin America has always been um, uh, a big concern of us, of ours, strategically since the beginning of the Republic. And uh, from James, James Monroe and before him onward. So Dr. Ellis focuses on that at the National War College Strategic Studies Institute, focusing especially on extra hemispheric powers and their activities there. Uh, this particular presentation, I think, is very important. It's on uh, democratic governance as a strategic imperative for the United States to focus on in Latin America. Um, so without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Ellis. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's a uh, privilege for me to be able to be here today and to be able to uh, share my, my thoughts and, and work uh, both with the, the group here and uh, the others who are following this online. Democratic governance is a term that you may have heard before in various different capacities, um, especially uh, coming out of the tradition of our uh, Department of State, a uh, variety of, of different programs uh, over the years. Um, today, I'm going to try to apply the concept of democratic governance in a different way, in a different political context. Uh, what I'm going to do basically today, uh, taking a look at some of the challenges in Latin America, especially two uh, big challenges to put the, the bottom line up front, uh, which is external uh, state actors um, and the challenges of, of, of corruption and, and transnational organized crime, is to make the argument that in this very complex environment that we have to deal with, that putting democratic governance forward and developing it as a strategic concept for how we order and prioritize and, and coordinate our different activities across the realm of government, DOD, Department of State, um, you know, uh, DEA, FBI, uh, USAID, etc., cetera, uh, is arguably the best way in the short and midterm uh, to be able to overcome some of the difficulties and achieve some of the successes in especially Latin America. I'll also along the way make the argument that the Latin America, although not often recognized, is um, a region that is absolutely fundamental to the security and prosperity of, of, of the nation. As a matter of fact, um, what I would argue right now is that Latin America is actually so important that we inadvertently treat it as a domestic issue. If you think about the politics that uh, led to uh, you know, our, our current president, our current Congress, many of the, uh, uh, you know, the most uh, the significant issues in our national discourse today, whether it's talking about the wall or, or immigration or, or security, indirectly it goes back to what is happening in, in Latin America. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, there's no other region in the world with which we have greater ties in terms of not only commerce, but some investment, uh, with which we have geographic connectivity that, that is closer. So basically what happens in the region, whether it's prosperity or the lack thereof, violence, uh, w uh, the uh, flow of, of, of human beings and the connection between um, the family here in the United States and, and the human beings in, in, in Latin America um, really drives, um, makes it, 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 what happens in Latin America be fundamentally of importance to, to, to the United States in a way that's almost different than any other part of the world. So that's a, a point I'm going to keep coming back to with today. But um, let me begin this uh, by talking a little bit about what I see as the strategic involvement, uh, environment in Latin America and in the Caribbean. I'm going to uh, be relatively brief with this. I just want to hit a, a few uh, key points. But um, what I see is important to understanding the Latin American in environment is the way in which there's an interplay between the conditions within the region and their historic precedents, uh, the various difficult, uh, difficulties such as transnational organized crime, um, and the way in which um, the political dynamics and others are taken advantage of and, and impacted by the activities of extra-regional actors. And here I'm mostly talking about China and Russia, but we can also talk about those who we see as less adversarial to the United States, whether it's Japan, South Korea, India, the European, uh, European Union, etc. But what I would argue here is, is it's important to understand the interplay between these two things, because oftentimes we think in terms of, of, of 
difficulties as, as linear. We think of, um, you know, this actor we have to take into consideration and this problem and, and we treat them separately. But I would argue that the most important dynamics of Latin America is understanding how do those things play off of each other. And at the same time, the solutions also comes about understanding how um, we have to incrementally manage that system again um, by tackling certain parts of it and coordinating that as, as it evolves over time. So with respect to um, transnational organized crime, it's important to recognize that um, it's not just a problem of violence, it's not just a problem of murders, um, those are the superficial challenges when you have uh, different uh, groups that fight each other, fight the government. Uh, if we take a look at the, the eruption of violence on, under first the Calderon administration during the, the war against the cartels and, and, and really accelerating in recent years uh, with, with the, uh, the end of, of the Enrique Peña Neto administration. If you take a look at the, the violence in, in Latin America, especially the Northern Triangle with the, with the Mares uh, groups such as Mares El Trucha, uh, Barrio 18. Uh, if you look really, if you look across, you see that um, you, you do have the dimension of, of challenges of public order through violence and crime, um, and that produces refugees and other things, but you also have challenges to um, institutions through the uh, criminal flows, um, and those are not, you know, it's not just a matter of, you know, bribing border officials or, or bribing police, but it's a matter of, of corruption that becomes so endemic that it causes people to fundamentally lose faith in the ability of their governments to solve those problems and the ability by electing or changing their governments um, to be able to, to address those problems. And I would argue that that becomes a fundamental strategic concern for, for us. Um, in my work with the uh, Department of Defense across the region, you see that uh, um, these uh, Interrelated challenges do drive uh, initiatives towards institutional reform. Uh, many times uh, it's uh, on the U.S. side, the Department of State-led uh, team trying to integrate uh, different resources to, um, to, to help uh, you know, bring things about the, the programs that reduce uh, corruption in police forces, uh, that, that change uh, the uh, you know, in, enhance uh, judicial capacities and partner nations, uh, etc. Um, and also across the region in different ways, uh, these challenges cause militaries in the region to think about how to involve themselves in support of or sometimes um, in lieu of uh, police forces and, and others just because the problems are so overwhelming. Now this is different in different countries depending on local traditions and, and laws and so in Honduras uh, the laws actually empower uh, the, the military to act directly through things such as the military police for, for public order, the, the famous PIMA. Uh, in other places such as Chile at the other extreme there's much more of a tradition of, of, of separation uh, you have others such as Argentina who find themselves you know, uncomfortably someplace in, in the middle of those two. But um, it does drive the public discourse you know, throughout the region. Uh, there are also a number of, of other things important to understand. Um, the way in which, and I just like to mention these because they're important things to keep in mind. Um, one, when we talk a lot about global economic interdependence, uh, understanding how the trade relationships and investment relationships also create uh, political dynamics and relations of a political dependence. And so uh, when we think about, uh, for example, Chinese activities in Latin America, oftentimes we, we say, well, if there's no military bases, I guess everything's okay. But sometimes we, we fail to understand how the um, relationships of economic dependence actually cause the leaders in the region to make certain decisions which either uh, go in ways which we would prefer not or, or undercut the U.S. agendas uh, such as promoting uh, human rights and, and uh, you know, promoting uh, uh, what we consider Western-style democratic governance. Uh, same thing with ideas, understanding how there is a global connectivity of, of, of ideas and how what happens in, in tweets in Washington uh, impacts uh, the uh, environment in, in the region and vice versa. Uh, again, we've talked about people uh, literally just today we're in the process of, of yet another uh, a wave of, of immigrants coming from the Northern Triangle uh, who started out from San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and who are coming, uh, I believe, uh, today uh, towards the Guatemalan border, etc. And of course, uh, you know, this coexists with other flows, such as the flow of more than 2.6 million uh, Venezuelans who have, who have permanently you know, left uh, their, their homes and who are going you know, throughout the region. Uh, it's not too long ago that we saw that here in the United States when we changed the wet foot, dry foot policy regarding uh, um, uh, the access of, of Cuban immigrants to, to the United States, um, how that uh, unleashed a, a refugee crisis that rippled throughout the region and, and the borders of, with, uh, with Costa Rica and Panama and Nicaragua, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, uh, we've talked about uh, extra hemispheric actors. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize here is, is that um, we shouldn't think in Monroe Doctrine terms about all extra hemisphere factors being inherently uh, 
bad or trying to do the same thing. There's really a mixture of complementarity um, and competitiveness of what different actors are going, different actors have different objectives. And so again, I just wanted to start out with one paintbrush of a little bit about how I see the Latin American environment to uh, set the stage for democratic governance. Now I'm going to go down into a little bit more detail about what I see as, as two of the core really challenge areas that I'm going to come back to specifically for democratic governance. Um, so number one is external state actors, especially Russia and China, and then the second will be transactional organized crime. So uh, let's move actually to take a, a one step down to look more in depth about extra hemispheric actors. First of all, again, as I suggested, important to recognize that each of the major actors from outside the region uh, has a, a different level of, of resources um, and reach and objectives as they go in the region. So when we talk about Russia, we tend to find that in general, um, the, uh, the, the Russians have a much more limited group of, of people with whom they can engage effectively as friends. That's traditionally been those nations who are uh, relatively anti-U.S. Uh, so in, in 2008, for example, when the Russians wanted to re-engage to prove to the United States that uh, you know if we were mucking around in their backyard, specifically in the context of uh, U.S. deployments uh, during the unfolding civil war in, in Georgia, then they could do something to muck around in our backyard. But when they wanted to send that message, the partners that they reached out to was basically a coalition of, of anti-U.S. actors. I mean, it was, it was Venezuela at the time, to, uh, to a lesser extent, it was, it was Cuba, it was uh, Ecuador a little bit, Bolivia a little bit. 2013-2014, um, when the Russians wanted to come back in to, um, to, to show a similar message uh, due to their displeasure over our opposition to their initiatives um, in support of their allies in, in the Ukraine and the Ukrainian civil war, uh, did very much the same thing. And so you, you see a, a pattern in which um, the Russians tend to work with a more limited group of, of, of countries in terms of, of their closest military interactions. Uh, similarly, um, with respect to sectors, uh, the Russians have obviously a strong uh, uh, export-oriented arms industry. Uh, we can talk about Rusbron Export and, and Rostec. Uh, they tend to have a, um, a relatively limited but, but important uh, 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 gas and oil in industry. So companies like you know Gazprom, companies like Rosneft, companies like like TMK, companies like Luke Oil, at different levels of, of commercial versus versus state involvement. Uh, the Russians uh, tend to have um, many fewer, I would say, resources. And so, for example, given the amount to which their economy depends on oil exports, when oil prices uh, dramatically fell, you actually saw that Russia's ability to finance arms sales through restaurant export, etc., fell off and, and really impacted um, Russia's ability to, to engage through the region in a way that did not happen with the other actor that I'm going to talk about in, in a few minutes here at uh, China. But... Um, also, again, there was a time that you probably, if you followed this a couple of years ago, that we talked a lot about Russia and China, and it seems like these days we talk a lot more about just China. Now, again, part of that is, again, the difference in, in economic depth. And so, frankly, uh, for those of you who know the uh, Latin American environment, you know that Latin American political leaders and business leaders just do not dream about vast access to Russian markets the way that they do about dreaming about vast access to, to Chinese markets. Um, also, um, in many ways, the limited number of, of Russian friends in, in the region, uh, this has been a relatively bad couple of years for Russian involvement in terms of the electoral cycle in, in Latin America, uh, thanks in part to some of the lessons that other parts of the region have learned from, from Venezuela. And so, for example, it really arguably started with the election of Mauricio Macri in, in Argentina, uh, you ha uh, again, um, you ending some of the uh, military sales and other opportunities that uh, the previous government of, of, of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner had created. Uh, the turn, um, the return of Sebastian Piñera in, in, in Chile and in the way that, uh, you know, that government, um, uh, the previous government, uh, the, the second incarnation of the government of Michel Bachelet had begun to open some possibilities for military diplomacy, you know, diplomacy with the Russians. Uh, the return of Pineda has, has kind of shut it off. Uh, Colombia, the recent uh, election of, of Ivan Duque. Um, Ivan Duque is arguably no friend of Russia, although he's you know, not necessarily you know, all doors closed. But um, you know, that has not been good news for the Russians. Uh, similarly, actually in, in Paraguay, a, a surprising, charismatic, uh, um, you know, relatively, um, you know, uh, relatively promising new government of, of, of President uh, Margarito Benitez. Um, and, and again, um, some of the doors that have begun to open in Russian-Paraguay relations have been, have been shut off. Uh, in El Salvador, as you may have been aware, uh, the, uh, the the previous uh, government of uh, former guerrilla leader uh, uh, Salvador Sanchez Saren, uh, again hardcore FMLN guerrilla fighter, uh, who uh, came to, to power uh, in, in in El Salvador uh, through, through democratic channels, but really was starting to 
move in a direction to be more synthetic, more open to cooperation with, with the Russians as, as well as, as others. Uh, the FMLN in El Salvador had a disastrous uh, result in, in March uh, elections uh, this year. They dropped down to about 23 seats out of the 84 seat assembly. And even with their, their allies, the, the, the Ghana coalition, um, they still won't even come close to, to half. Uh, and it's very likely that in El Salvador's February elections that uh, the, uh, um, the uh, centrist candidate, Dani Bukele, uh, will um, will actually win. Uh, and so as that moves you away from the, uh, President Martinez and, and a return of the FMLN, again, that, that shuts or at least uh, closes a bit another door for the Russians. And of course, Brazil, by, by all accounts, it appears that uh, um, that uh, Jair Bolsonaro uh, will probably win uh, the Brazilian elections, uh, um, or, or at least uh, it's, uh, unless something unexpected happens. And again, um, uh, Bolsonaro, has, uh, through his discourse, suggested he is he's no great friend of, of, of the Russians. And so in many ways, it's, it's been a difficult electoral cycle in, in Latin America for, for the Russians, and yet there are opportunities. And so, for example, one, one looks at uh, where things might go with uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador in Mexico, um, with respect to at least some of the sympathies that, that, that exist um, politically and, and some of the opportunities that if one wants to move, move away from, from the United States. Well, let me talk a little bit about the, uh, the PRC, however, because I would argue that um, while we talk a bit about Russia, um, over the long term, although the PRC tries very actively not to get involved with um, gov um, with uh, um, with uh, you know explicitly anti-U.S. activities, it really presents the most significant long-term challenge to to the United States in, in the region. And one of the things, as you're aware, one of the dimensions of, of Chinese engagement in, in the region, of course, is the end to the informal truce that had existed from 2008 to 2016 between the PRC um, and the um, and the Republic of China, otherwise known as as Taiwan. Um, over the basically um, you know, stealing of diplomatic recognition from, from each other. Now, as that's broken down, first in Africa and now in Latin America, uh, and you may have heard some of the discourse about, uh, for example, the change in, by Panama in 2017, then the change by the Dominican Republic recognizing the PRC, and most recently, just uh, you know, just about a month ago here, uh, the, the change by the, the government of, of El Salvador, uh, prompting our recall of, of, of ambassadors and really trying to take a look at what this means. The Countries that continue to recognize Taiwan that very well could uh, change recognition um, with associated uh, packages of, of, of construction work and, and, and other government contracts and, and possible assistance and expanded uh, military security, political, economic engagement by, by the PRC, um, they're all pretty close to the United States. And so you, you basically have the four countries in really the northern half of, of Central America, so to the extent that Belize considers itself a, a Central American country. Um, but, uh, but, you have, uh, but you have, of course, uh, Guatemala, you, you have Honduras, and, and you have, of course, the troubled Nicaragua. Uh, in the Caribbean, you've got four others, and of course, you've got Paraguay, which may change or could change sometime in the future. Uh, and so you have the prospect that this new end game for this uh, you know, could, could play itself out very close to the United States. And many people say, well, what is China really looking to do? Is it, is it about military bases? And my, my personal feeling is that the best way to understand it is kind of a strategic game of, of go. You, you may have heard this analogy before, but fundamentally a war of, of position. Of, of, and that, that means that the Chinese are fundamentally seeking to achieve certain things. They're, they're interested. They, they need access to resources. They need access to, to markets. They need access to foodstuffs. They need technology as, as they expand and diversify their, their, their economic base to make it ever stronger and more competitive. Now, it's not, well, it's just about economics. It's not strategic. But what I would argue is that in order to do that, they play an expanding game of, of position, establishing a position in one market, using that position of economic and political dependency to... Um, get to know that country better, to, to expand the position in that market, to be able to, to launch into similar markets. You see an incremental process of learning as Chinese companies have operated on, on, on the ground. But also, frankly, it's a very, what I would call, it's very mercantilistic at its core. If you remember the ways in which um, you know, the British East India Company and, and the Dutch, to a certain degree, um, basically sought through the control of, of maritime routes and shipping routes to, to maintain economic advantage, basically creating a flow of resources you know, through, through ports and access to markets that, that really advantaged them. Um, the Chinese actually did something very similar uh, really throughout their history. If, if you go back to what the Chinese used to talk about with the old uh, Silk Road, uh, so for example, um, you know, fundamentally it was part of the system by which tribute flowed from the barbarian periphery into the Chinese core in, in a manner that was designed to bring riches and, and power and, and bolster security of, of China. Um, in many ways, um, the, the new One Belt, One Road uh, initiative 
goes back to that Chinese mercantilistic core. It is um, you know, about really creating a flow of value. As the Chinese try to capture global value added in terms of, of their expansion into the banking system, in terms of their expansion into um, the, the um, you know, going, up, going up the, the chain of, of, of value adding companies, to, um, to really do things in, in a way that structure those, those flows in a way that benefits them. And so if you look at specifically the, you know, the Maritime Silk Road, the um, One Belt One Road, what it tends to be all about is, is control over strategic ports, um, not necessarily just for military things, although the military in places as we've seen, such as Djibouti, can, can be drawn in later. But it, it's, about, um, it's about the flow of goods through their transport. So, for example, a China Overseas Shipping Company or, or Costco. Um, and you probably hear more about Hutchinson, but it's really more about Costco, I, I would argue, right now. Um, but it's also, you know, who constructs the ports? It's, it, it's Chinese companies. It's Chinese loans. It's basically Chinese standards and relationships that are set up by political agreements, often in a very untransparent way. Um, and so my point about this is really not to go into the, the individual details, but what I tend to see is, is that strategically there's a whole structuring of the relationship from you know, ports to maritime flows to construction to finance with basically Chinese economic strategic objectives in mind. Um, and this plays out in, in Latin America among other places. And one of the ways that that plays out is, is through basically um, you know, weak or needy local governments. Um, Again, I just want to make the point that with respect to political military relationships, that these, in my judgment, are what I would call derivative or, or enabling. In other words, if you look at, for example, how the Chinese got involved in, in doing work in Africa, um, in the base in Djibouti, uh, the Chinese actually started out doing increased commercial flows you know, through Africa and then realized that they needed to basically bring the PLA Navy in to do counter piracy operations. And so, you know, off of the um, you know, off of the coast of Africa, and then once you start doing counter piracy operations, you need a place to, to base your ships to do that. Again, in support of, of commerce, and so you've got the base in Djibouti. There is a need to break out, um, perhaps to, to not be hemmed in uh, just through, through Asia. And so, interest in, for example, developing the port of water in, in Pakistan, or or the uh, um, you've probably heard quite a bit about the port of the port in Sri Lanka of of of, um, of, of Hamban Toto that, that recently they, they got access to. Um, but throughout all of this, the the bottom line is that once you have the the economic relationships and um, the the political influence derives from that. And the need to do military things basically to protect your flows of commerce because at the end of the day, it's, it's about your enrichment um, comes from that. Um, institutional changes, we find that the PRC is, is also looking to change the world um, in, in ways uh, basically that make it uh, safe for the continued rise of, of China. Again, I refer to this kind of the, the modern reincarnation of the Chinese uh, tribute system. And so, you know, you see work, for example, to, to adjust institutions and the rules and partnerships in, in places like, for example, the Inter-American Development Bank, which the PRC joined in 2009, doing new, new loan partnerships, um, through their individual bilateral strategic partnerships in the region, through multilateral activities like the China SLAC Forum, uh, through uh, some military-to-military -military relationships that they acknowledge um, is in, in their uh, 2015 uh, white paper that the military actually supports these plans. Uh, through the um, through through the internationalization of, of yuan through the, the renminbi uh, basically to, to make sure that they are not dependent on a dollar denominated international financial system which would again financially be, be very dangerous for, for the continued rise um, so the Chinese tried to make the world safe for the continued rise of China but at the end of the day we really come down to a fundamental idea well if we were moving into a world where the Chinese are capturing the value added and capturing the power and changing these institutions well, why should we care and at the end of the day, you come down, and, and the Chinese themselves only fleetingly talk about Tianxia, um, but this, this idea of a system of ordered relationships of, of the international universe. Um, but what I would argue is that while the Chinese are not seeking to have a competing concept of world ideological domination, the way we used to think of the U.S. versus the Soviet Union, um, the idea of a Chinese world that is oriented around flows of wealth to China and the dominance of, of Chinese commercial institutions and the ordering of relationships um, you know, according to Chinese power, this is very different than the idea of universal human rights that we're used to in the United States or, or universal rights of, of, of states, depending on whether you're a small state or, or the absolute principles of, of international you know, justice. And so I would argue that, that these are indeed things of, of concern. But again, so what we see overall with extra hemispheric actors is that um, you know it's not necessarily just about the military activities, but especially when we look, we look at China, um, that uh, 
the expansion of, of the Chinese um, into uh, economic relationships, into port relationships, into public contracting, into other types of relationships um, is a matter of, of concern. And it's one of the concerns that is enabled in part through weak governance in the region. Um, let me say just a few things about transnational organized crime, not as much uh, in detail. But uh, let me uh, just briefly comment that, that first of all, uh, it's, it's useful to think of, of multiple types of, of uh, organized crime groups. You have some of the big groups that do international finance. We think of some of the Mexican cartels, such as Sinaloa or, or Jalisco Nueva Generación. Uh, you have some groups that call themselves gangs that are really international cartels, such as the expanding uh, First Capital Command, the PCC in Brazil, or, or its uh, older uh, cousin, uh, Commando de Melo. Uh, you have um, some groups who are more territorially oriented, such as the Salvadoran gangs, who basically concentrate on dominating territory and may, you know, co-opt or charge rents to those who pass through or use their territory and may sometimes get somewhat involved in flows such as drugs, but are really mostly about the territorial control. You have some, what I would call criminal intermediaries. These are people who do certain things, uh, smuggling groups in, in, for example, Salvador, such as the Peronas or, or, or the Texas cartel or the old, um, or, or the old Lorenzana or Mendoza family in, in Guatemala, for example. Um, and, and understanding just how this is a very complex uh, space. And again, it's not just about drugs, although we often co-inflate narco-trafficking with, uh, with organized crime, but, it, but it's about a portfolio of activities, again, that leverage the weakness of, of government in, in many different ways, um, contraband, extortion, kidnapping, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a codependence between legitimate business and illegitimate business. Uh, essentially, you cannot operate an illicit economy without having an illicit one. Um, you know, how would you get transportation, how would you uh, do some of the, the fundamental things, you know, you need a chemical industry, or at least the ability to import chemicals if, if you're going to move drugs. Um, you need a financial system if you're going to be able to earn money and legitimize your, your, your earnings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and frankly, you need also an informal economy to be able to have access both to the people who work as the, you know, your, you know the, the soldiers in your, in your, you know, illicit army, if you will, and you also need, um, an informal economy because it's through a cash-based economy that you can basically hide the illegitimate sources of wealth you eventually legitimize. But again, you recognize that things like the informal economy and things like these other activities really depend on weakness of the state. At the end of the day, I would, I would emphasize that for me, it's, it's about four things. Resources, um, where are the where are the, really the centers of gravity um, in this? I, I would say number one is resources. As one of my colleagues, Selena Rolio, says, it's about the money. Uh, so if you think about it, um, without the ability to gain and legitimize their, their money, uh, criminal organizations cannot bribe the officials in the country. They cannot recruit and maintain the large organizations that they do. They cannot purchase arms and other things to intimidate. They cannot actually create the illicit productive structures, whether it's, um, you know, narco labs or, or, or submarines and tow buoys to move product, um, all of that begins to fall apart if, if, you, if you cut the money. Um, also, the cycle of corruption and impunity. This isn't just about corruption in you know, blocking the flows of illicit goods. At the end of the day, when you have you know, thoroughly corrupted police forces, you, you undercut interagency collaboration because you have you know, military who is afraid to share their information with the police until everyone's in the, in the same helicopter or vehicle going to the op because they're worried that somebody's going to blow it. You have um, citizens who do not trust the police and other authorities to come forward and, and offer to even report crimes, let, let alone uh, come forward and, and risk of being on the record uh, uh, witnesses and, and things like that. And so once that breaks down, the entire structure um, of, the, uh, of the criminal justice system breaks down and you have impunity. And if you have impunity, of course, you have more crime. Um, and at the end of the day, if you have corruption and impunity at seemingly uncontrollable levels, then again, citizens begin to lose faith in the ability of their system to resolve these things through democratic means, opening a door to let's try more, more extreme solutions. And at the end of the day, also political will is important because solving all these things in real ways and not just kind of managing the violence or managing the appearance of crime 
uh, implies costs. And so, as we saw again with the Calderon administration, Mexico as, as well as the um, as, as well as the Enrique Peña Nieto administration and, and others, um, oftentimes really going after the bad guys generates uncertainty, generates competition between the groups who are left after you take down your leaders. That generates violence. Uh, oftentimes, there are economic costs as well. So there's one case in Honduras, for example, when they took uh, down um, uh, Jaime Rosendahl, who was uh, in, uh, a leading financier, uh, head of uh, something called, called Grupo Continental, which is kind of like taking down Citibank in the, in the United States. I mean, it was so large, about a fifth of the entire Honduran economy was, was tied to Grupo Continental. Um, it literally put at least temporarily thousands of people out of work. And so going after the resources, going after the cycle of corruption and making sure that you have political will, I, I would argue, are are key. Um, but also the key is um, you probably hear a lot about the term whole of government uh, approaches. And I, I would argue that whole of government is uh, it's a useful concept. Um, and I think most governments in Latin America and elsewhere actually do a whole of government to some degree or another, to the extent that they understand that you have to have some development, you have to have some law enforcement, you have to have some, you know, reform to your institutions. What I would argue they don't do well is actually coordinating the implementation of, of whole of government and adapting it as the situation evolves after they basically act against the enemy. Um, to use a, a military analogy, for example, um, you know, if one talks about combined arms warfare, no a uh, decent military officer would say that combined arms warfare just means that you throw some infantry in and you throw some cavalry in and you throw some logistics in and, and uh, as long as you've got a little bit of everything, that's, that's combined arms. No, of course not. What combined arms is all about is, is bringing those things together and, and using them and, and adapting the way that they coordinate in, in, in the battlefield as the battle unfolds and as the enemy reacts to the initial engagement. And I would argue that, that making whole of government work against transnational organized crime is, is the same basic problem. You have to uh, not only have a little bit of everything, but it's how you coordinate and, and how you adapt. Okay, a few comments about what we've seen as kind of the U.S. response to date to these two really serious challenges, extra hemispheric actors and transnational organized crime. And again, really my, my key point in this whole presentation is the importance of having a strategic concept to really order, to help you to prioritize, to help you to coordinate, to really help you to guide what the different organizations within the U.S. government are, are, are doing. Um, now, again, a very important caveat, um, I, as somebody who actually works with uh, many of our strategic planners, at least on, on the DoD side, we actually do have a pretty good, well-developed strategic planning processes across the interagency. Um, we have a, a pretty thorough national security strategy. Indeed, if you look at some of the things that are happening now with, with China, you saw that those China-Russia things were actually initially laid out in the new national security strategy. Uh, you have a derivative national military strategy. You have other derivative documents, such as the Quadrennial Defense Review or, or on the state side, the QDDR. Um, you have, at least on the DOD side, um, the component commands such as SOUTHCOM and NORTHCOM, for example, for, for Latin America, have their own theater stat strategies and derivative campaign plans. You have a new document that's in, in the process of coming out for the Western Hemisphere called the Regional Campaign Plan. And in each of the countries in, in Latin America, you have what's called integrated country team strategies, basically under the leadership of the ambassador. You try to figure out how to bring together the resources that the DOD brings to country, that state brings to country, that USAID brings to country that you know all of the other you know entities uh, you know again you know, DEA sometimes FBI etc the problem thus is not that there's no strategic planning the real problem is that this goodness basically breaks down before getting to a coherent thorough solution and why is that um, part of it is about budgetary flights uh, again a budget is the sausage making um, if you think about all of the processes of you know, not actually getting budgets, you know, the president's budget being dead on arrival, um, getting um, having to go year after year, um, this year being one of the few exceptions with DOD, uh, continuing resolutions, uh, congressional plus-ups for, for, for favorite program. So the budgetary certainty there is, is, is not so much there. Of course, uh, with Department of State especially, where some of the most important governance programs come from, you have a lot of reductions. Uh, you have, of course, uh, competing needs, and so when you have operational needs in, in places like Afghanistan or Iraq or elsewhere in the Middle East, um, the um, again, finding money to do basically DOD theater engagement programs in Latin America, which is seemingly you know, peaceful and, and no nuclear weapons you know, coming at you directly, um, it 
it's hard to justify those line items. Matter of fact, if you looked at the, the, the new um, national defense authorization for, for the current year, um, it's striking that although you have by name mention of certain other regions, that Latin America doesn't even get mentioned with, with the exception, I think, of Guantanamo Bay and, and a few small things. Um, so you really get driven to this, in, this orientation when you are a program officer in an em embassy or when you're working in one of these bureaucracies where you're just trying to defend and execute your program. Just take your little piece of the pie, try to define it with achievable network net, um, metrics, uh, basically execute the program. And at the end of the day, your little program doesn't sum up with all the rest of the little programs to, to really have a coherent impact on, on the region. Well, you know, that's just life in the big bureaucracy. Um, which is which is a real a shame, and that's why I'm, I'm really grasping with this issue. Um, of course, you also have coordination challenges, and again, this goes to um, all of the major bureaucracies that engage at the country team level um, basically have planning processes at the regional level. So for DOD, as I mentioned before, you have Southcom and Northcom's theater plans. Um, again, um, with, uh, with the um, Department of State, uh, you, know, you have you know, entities you know, such as narcotics and law enforcement who have you know, their kind of theater strategies, if you will. You have, uh, you have uh, um, you know, you, even with the Western Hemisphere, you, you have that, that planning. So the problem then becomes that at the country team level, the, the poor ambassador in the country team um, you know, takes this ever-changing little bucket of money, um, and, and everybody who's coming in at the theater level, state has its kind of theater level plan, DOD has its theater level plan, everyone has its theater level plan, the money is always changing, and so by, by the time you try to coordinate everyone else's basically theater-wide plan to the little piece that you get at the country level, it may or may not still fully make sense. And if you lose track of whether it makes sense or not, well, you know, then you just go to the bottom denominator of let's just execute the program and, and get something done and, and hope for the best. Um, if that wasn't hard enough, of course, we are still in the process of a political transition right now. Um, we have a substantial number of ambassadors across Latin America who are, again, the, the integrators of the country team strategy who have, um, you know, basically, if you're trying to, to operate things with the Charge of Affairs, with the Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, it just doesn't have the same authority. Uh, and to make things worse, of course, uh, in major components of the bureaucracy who should be figuring out these strategies. So, for example, um, you know, we are still waiting on the confirmation now, about a year into this, of the, um, the Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs, uh, Kim Breyer. Um, you have, uh, um, in some organizations, uh, you have actually a pretty good team, and you have long had a good team on the NSC, um, both at senior levels, uh, you know, people like, 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 like uh, General Rick Waddell, who unfortunately kind of moved away from the Western Hemisphere portfolio, uh, people like Juan Cruz. Uh, but the problem is, you know, so for example, in the case of, of Juan Cruz, who was recently replaced by Mauricio Claver Caron, um, you have so much movement that you lose some of that, that, that continuity. And so, and then of course you have, uh, if, if that wasn't enough, you, you have the ever unpredictable um, intermission of executive level um, you know, decision makings and public communications um, in the middle of what you hope is otherwise an irrational you know, process. And so again, my, my point isn't to say that the sky is falling here, but my point is to really illustrate how an otherwise good process with a decent amount of resources breaks down and gets sub-optimized and that we don't get to deal with some of the things that we need to get. Um, I'm not going to go through a whole lot of detail on, on this. Um, this is actually from a, a methodology referred to as, as system dynamics that I found useful over the years to, to think through some of the ways in which the problems that we face are actually interdependent and interconnected to get us away from kind of a mentality of thinking of just this isolated problem and this isolated problem. Let me see this. this turn it off or is this high? Is this a laser? I have no idea. Okay. okay so I, won't, I won't take a chance. You're okay. trying to go to another screen or what? I'm, I'm looking for a laser. Let's see if that's a laser turns off. Oh, that turns off. Try to okay. get there. We're good. All right. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to point. Okay, so, um, so for example, if you uh, follow me for just a minute here, you can see that when, when you take a look at observable things such as, uh, and, and again, um, the, the, uh, the arrows here represent the cause-effect relationships. And so you know, that, the idea that there's an arrow from, from here to here uh, indicates that there is a, there is a effect. Um, and there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a cause and an effect. And so the idea is that if you have more uh, law enforcement effectiveness, you're going to be able to take down more of the operation of criminal groups in the country. Or if you have greater law enforcement effectiveness, you will be able to undermine some of the revenue flows of uh, criminal groups. Your um, mic stopped and we need that for the people watching online. Uh, okay. Are you there? Okay. Good. Great. Okay. So 
<clears throat> so what you see is the cause-effect relationship, and so is, for example, the idea is if you have greater law enforcement effectiveness, you, you are more effective in, in reducing criminal revenue flows. Uh, so as you become more effective in reducing criminal revenue flows, then theoretically that is going to undercut the position of the criminal groups in the country. You see there are a lot of things that are interrelated. So, for example, corruption over here. Corruption, as we recognize, undermines law enforcement, but, um, and so as law enforcement becomes less effective, uh, it actually opens a broader door for, for corruption. May have, have a battery issue. Okay. I'll keep talking and I'll keep turning it on and off. Okay. So, um, should give me this up here. Okay, great, thank you. As you can see, their, their, their team here is just really on top of their game. So, corruption, um, so is, not only do you have the, the feedback with law enforcement effectiveness, but for example, um, the more corruption you have in a society and the more criminal groups you have operating in the country, that tends to break down, create a culture. And you hear about this in certain areas like, like Sinaloa and Mexico or others, where you just you have a culture of, of, of a lack of, of values and, and a culture that accepts lawfulness, uh, lawlessness. And as you have that, it makes corruption become more easy, etc., etc. And making the situation worse, of course, is you get more corruption and that makes law enforcement less effective. You have more criminal operations in the country that gets you more criminal violence um, that um, undermines the health of the legal economy. Then what happens? Well, on the one hand, um, you have things like a contagion effect. If you think about this as like, like a virus, how does a virus basically kill its host cell and then go and spread to other cells? Well, one of the areas is through this notion of, of refugees. And we're seeing this obviously right now in Venezuela, we're seeing this right now in the Northern Triangle countries, we're seeing this in, in many other places. Um, and so if you think about, for example, the flow of, of Venezuelan refugees into places like Cucata, Colombia, and about 5,000 Venezuelan refugees a day are arriving in Cucata. Um, and uh, while many of them pass through Colombia, um, many try to make a living for a while in the informal economy, trying to just survive, but that those desperate people contribute to the activities of criminal groups who exploit them. It contributes to illicit activities in, in, in the area. Um, it, uh, it, it contributes to a lot of other problems. And so in many ways, those refugees, um, without saying the refugees themselves are bad people, but their sheer human need and volume uh, tends to put stresses on all of the places that, that, that they, they go and, um, and, and uh, basically help to, con to take weak governance and make that a, a problem in, in other places. Um, but in addition to, to the issue of, of refugees and, and the way in which that can create a contagion effect throughout the region, you also see how this can become disastrous in terms of, of populism. If you ask yourself, where did populism really come from, for example, the, um, the election of Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, and you know, again, through electoral means, or Rafael Correa, who came to power in Ecuador, or, 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 or Evo Morales, who came, came to power after the, the loss of, of faith in the old government of, 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 of the MAS. Um, in almost all of the cases, frustration again with the levels of corruption, with the inability of elected party systems to solve the, these problems, led citizens to accept non-democratic or non-traditional solutions in, in different structures. And so again, the argument is the worse things get um, in, in the country in managing these things, um, the combination of that increase in corruption, the combination of a culture where people aren't as attentive to the resolution of things through democratic means and transparency. The uh, increasing uh, difficulty in the, the economy providing jobs through the legitimate economy. Um, increasing criminal violence. These things all lead citizens to accept non-democratic solutions. Um, and when that happens, that makes it more likely that you have populist regimes come to power. And so in many ways, um, almost all the populist regimes we have in the region, and even if we take a look at, at the, the horrors of, of the Ortega regime in Nicaragua, um, both in his coming to power because the abuses of the Somoza regime you know, preceded him when he came to power in 1979, the first time, and during the current you know, current time, again, um, through some of the, 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 the machinations that, that, that he made in, in the party structure um, in 2000, 2006. The, but the, the bottom line is, across the region, that you have, that those problems with democratic governance open the door for populist regimes. 
And who do populist regimes need if they want to do things in, in a different way? When they turn away from traditional Western pressures for oversight and mon international monetary fund, et cetera, um, by logic, they are looking for alternative sources of funding, alternative trading partners, and we live in an era in which uh, those alternative sources um, are here, here are plenty, uh, specifically uh, the, the PRC and, and its associated, uh, you, know, um, you, uh, you know, the China Development Bank, uh, China Exim Bank, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see this process in which uh, opening the door to populist regimes then opens the door to them um, engaging with extra hemispheric actors. Engaging with extra hemispheric actors, as we've seen from, from Panama to Venezuela, elsewhere, opens up the door for even greater corruption because, again, they are um, they're, they're changing their institutional processes. You're, you're, you're having decreased oversight. You have less transparency. You have money coming in from actors that are not committed to some of those, those types of, of, of oversight regimes. And frankly, the more things get worse and, and the more that you get pushed down that, 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 that route, um, the more that the money and financing from um, extra hemispheric actors um, helps to keep populist regimes such as, for example, the Maduro government in, in Venezuela in, in power. So my point about all of this really, to take this in a nutshell, is A, it's, obviously it's complicated. It's, this, is, you know, this might look like a big blue bowl of spaghetti, but hopefully at least from some of these illustrations you get the idea that for me to understand the dynamics of of how corruption leads you to populism, how populism leads you to extra hemispheric actors, all these reinforcing effects, you realize that you know it's not enough to just attack one part of the the government or one part of the problem. Okay, so um, just very quickly, and I'm not I'm not going to dwell too much on this slide, but. Um, you know, some question of well, what do we really mean by democratic governance? Obviously, it involves the, the word governance and the word uh, you know democratic. And I will admit that um, again, it's it's the idea of the ability of the organization who administers a territory to do so efficiently and effectively, um, basically to assemble and employ resources to address what I would say are the legitimate objectives of, of the administration. So I try to make this as neutral as possible. Um, and obviously, there are a lot of differences about what is the proper role of government. I, I think, in general, most people agree that there's some notion of defending territory, some notion of, of combating crime and insecurity within the territory, some notion of, of having maintaining some justice, perhaps rule of law in the territory, and something about advancing whether it's you know prosperity, whatever that means. Not necessarily monetary prosperity, but but some type of prosperity. And what do we mean by democratic? Again, many people can disagree, but this idea that people within the territory should at least have some direct or indirect control about what the government does and how. Um, and so what I'm really trying to say with democratic governance is that, as we talked about before, most of the challenges we see in the region, I would argue, come back to these weaknesses in democratic governance. And so, again, I'm going to go a little bit faster in the interest of time because I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to uh, keep you here all, all, all afternoon with this, but the idea basically being that if you think about the inability to um, have, have spaces in which you can uh, you know, keep criminal groups like, like the FARC or ELN in Columbia out, or um, you know, combat the, the influence of, of cartels such as the Jalisco Nueva Generación in, in Mexico, etc., or you know, groups like Mara Salvatrucha, Barrio 18, or, or others in, in the Northern Triangle, um, that the lack of governance causes it. And as again, we just talked about um, that corruption at the end of the day um, opens the door because you have a loss of faith to solving problems through established governance, which leads to populists, which leads you to extra hemispheric actors, which leads you to more types of problems. I also want to explicitly recognize here that um, there is often, you know, there are things that the U.S. has not always done well um, that has contributed. Obviously, U.S. demand for, for drugs and other things contributes to the problems of the region. Obviously, uh, U.S. Uh, the ability to uh, obtain arms relatively easily and, and export them, however, illicitly um, into the region from the, from the U.S. contributes to the problem. Uh, we can take a look at history and argue that the United States is sometimes uh, you know, supported in, for whatever reason, uh, very questionable uh, elites. Um, but my point with this is that whatever the U.S. contributions, which I just I want to go on record of acknowledging, you know, that yes, the U.S. has contributed to the problem, but the fact that we may have contributed to the problem doesn't detract from the importance of diagnosing the problem effectively and figuring out the best way to, to deal with it. Um, so again, um, and I already. I won't repeat this too much, but uh, I just, again, the importance of understanding the threat of lack of governance in system, systemic terms, how a country you can think of in some ways as like a, a, a cell, an infestation. And you can 
go back to the historical structural reasons why things are what they did, combinations of bad policies, corruptions, you know, lack of, of, of vigilance um, you know, with, within the state itself. But again, really the important thing as we talked about in the, in the spaghetti diagram is, is this notion of reinforcing di uh, dynamics. How more corruption um, decreases the state's ability to combat crime, how that decreases state effectiveness, how that allows crime to expand even, even farther, how that hurts the investment environment, how that causes a fall in the legitimate economy, which pushes even more people into the criminal economy, how eventually you have a, a loss of, of faith in the system uh, leading to populace, etc., etc. And at, at the end of the day, um, these bad things, again, the contagion of one cell to other cells, how through dynamics such as refugees, etc., that when something bad happens in one place, that creates a strain and creates contagion effects in, in other states. So. Why then is a concept of governance key? Why isn't it just a matter of why isn't it a matter of just uh, adding more resources to to the problem? First of all, what I would argue is is fundamentally there is no state that has enough resources that just by applying enough law enforcement or or enough whatever enough if you say well, let's attack it through developmental strategies. There is not enough money in developmental strategies to to solve the problems as as they exist. You have to have incremental solutions. But the problem is that anytime you attack the system, the threat evolves over, over time. And so then there, then there becomes a question of coordination. So this was the, the classic cases were, for example, what used to be called the heavy-handed approach, uh, Mano Duro or Super Mano Duro in, in first El Salvador, and then Honduras in, in the early 2000s. But it's a continuing lesson. So when you do enforcement actions against the those who are causing insecurity directly, and in that case it was the it was the street gangs, then you create new bottlenecks in your legal system. You create new bottlenecks because you don't have a system that's good enough to to, to basically keep the people in jails. The people you can get in the jails, if you don't have adequate control and separation uh, within your jails, then essentially the jails just become incubators um, and, and organizations by which basically the bad guys can control and coordinate from the outside, from, from within the jails, etc. And so linear approaches tend to be very vulnerable. Um, in the same way, I would also argue that in a very different way, addressing the external actor challenge um, really needs a democratic governance approach. And you say, well, and you hear a lot about the Monroe Doctrine, um, but what I would argue is that fundamentally, whatever strategic message you use, um, it just will not turn out well in this age of economic and political interdependence and maturity of, of Latin America to make the argument that we should try to block or impede our uh, partners in the hemisphere from engaging with Russia or engaging with China. Uh, it just, it will generate resentment. Uh, there are you know, not you know, the military capabilities in all of the U.S. arsenal to, to make that happen, nor in other parts of the U.S. government. The alternative, however, is to say that if to a certain degree the U.S. accepts global interdependence, but we work on strengthening our partner institutions, again, trying to boost governance to more effectively take advantage of the economic opportunities uh, offered by those partners. So emphasizing transparency, emphasizing rule of law, emphasizing bureaucratic planning processes which can basically um, you know, not get taken to the cleaners by the Chinese through the fine print in the contracts, um, that can resist the kind of state-to-state -state, uh, deals that the Chinese like to engage in, etc. Um, at the same time, you have um, what you get at the end of the day through that alternative approach is first of all you build goodwill because if you do it sincerely and effectively you create the notion that the United States is acting as a new type of partner um, trying to help our partners in Latin America to build their own economies by by better taking advantage of the opportunities that China and others has to offer. At the same time, you basically inoculate the countries in the region against the type of more manipulating effects that um, can be brought in when you have these non-transparent deals. Does that mean that there is um, you know, no risk that the Chinese or the Russians or others will try to do untoward things? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, if you say, well, if the blocking approach just isn't gonna work and it's gonna create resentment, it's gonna disengage you and your leverage, um, then at the end of the day, um, you know, this becomes, one would argue, a, a strategic course with some effect, some, some prospect of effectiveness. Is that your phone or is it behind you? I'm not sure what's going on. That's me. My apologies. Okay. Okay, so don't worry, I'm not going to go through this entirely again, but I, just, I, I wanted to go back to the same 
diagram and, and illustrate some of the ways in which um, understanding these same relationships that focus on positive governance can actually incrementally begin to turn around some of these maladies. So for example, consider where we started before with um, if we could actually increase through State Department and other programs the effectiveness of law enforcement. And we, we try to do this all the time, we just never do it well for reasons that I explained previously. Um, and you can actually decrease the operation of criminal groups in the country. You can decrease um, uh, criminal revenue flows by being more effective in, in interdiction. By decreasing the operations, you undercut the revenue flows even more. By undercutting the revenue flows, you further reduce the size of groups. By reducing the size of groups, you reduce their ability to corrupt law enforcement officials. By reducing corruption, you make your law enforcement even more effective, which lets you take on corruption even more. By reducing corruption, you also have a side benefit of basically um, beginning to generate more citizen confidence in cooperating with the government. Now you have better on-the-ground intelligence and, and witness participation in law enforcement system, etc., making law enforcement even more effective. As they become more effective, they um, reduce the operations of criminal groups in the country even farther, and they reduce corruption even more. At the same time, as you have less corruption, you have citizens who are less willing to accept non-democratic solutions. They're willing to, to give the system a try. Um, as you have less operations of criminal groups in the country, you have less criminal violence. You have less refugees and, and less contagion effects throughout the region. As you have less criminal violence, you have more health of the legal economy. This is part of the success of what was called the Democratic Security Strategy in, in Colombia of Alvaro Uribe, um, not, not too long ago. Um, as you have more health of the legal economy, you have even fewer refugees. Uh, also, as you have a healthier economy, uh, citizens are more willing to give the government a chance. Um, as you have less criminal violence, again, citizens are more willing to give democratic governance a chance. Um, as you also fight corruption, you also begin to restore somewhat over time the culture of, of values and, and lawfulness. And the more that you recreate and strengthen that good civic culture, the more you make your country and its institutions more resistant against corruption. And, and again, um, that gives you all kinds of other benefits. Um, so by a culture of lawfulness, you have a reduction in the number of people who are available for criminal activity, which decreases even more the operation, the ability of groups to recruit and, and operate in the country, um, which basically contributes even more to having a culture of lawfulness. So sometimes you say, well, what's the difference between you know, the US political culture to the extent that we like to beat our chest and say that you know, there's a difference between our political culture and some parts of, of Latin America. Um, to the extent that you accept that notion, um, part of it are these, these subtle incremental changes. It's not one thing or another, but it's over time um, these, how these small changes create these differences in, in, in culture that make outcomes be fundamentally different, even though the factors that underlie them are just a little bit different. But again, at the end of the day, if you have citizens who are support, um, who basically support democratic processes and, and institutions, then that makes you less vulnerable to populist regimes, which makes you, um, you know, which actually strengthens the legal economy even farther because you don't have the, the slide to populism like you had in Venezuela, which solves, you know, which strengthens other things. And if you're less vulnerable to populist regimes, um, you tend to get better deals and interact and be more resistant to the abuses of extra hemispheric actors. So, come to the very last slide here. And so the question is, okay, having just kind of sketched out this interaction, what is the path for it? Obviously it's very hard because doing this effectively depends on our ability to coordinate internally and, and elsewhere, elsewhere um, across our own interagencies. In an environment where you have uh, ever-changing budgets, um, partners with different objectives, etc., etc., our own and our partners in perfect institutions, um, and the way that the threat evolves o over time. However, the fact that it's hard doesn't mean that this is not a decent way of, of going about things. Um, so one of the things I would argue is that, I'm going to start very, at the very high level, um, that uh, there are certain places in which just the mere concept of democratic governance could get more attention. So for example, to have a, a framing concept within the next iteration of the national security strategy. Um, to have uh, it be championed by the White House itself, uh, to uh, be worked uh, through the NSC and the Department of, of State, uh, and others, really to make this a viable uh, concept at, at all levels. And, and frankly, uh, to have a certain amount of congressional buy-in to the notion of the importance of predictable decision-making and democratic governance um, to the degree to which that 
uh, at least to a certain degree, uh, helps to move you away from a culture of continuing resolutions and congressional plus-ups and more towards a, a central emphasis on, 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 on trying to get the governance forward in a, in a predictable environment. Uh, frankly, it's something that needs to be socialized more to the interagency. And I'm talking about specific organizations, policy planning, and Department of State, um, you know, within the uh, or Office of Secretary of Defense's policy organization, for example, at Western Hemisphere Affairs, among others, um, within the Western Hemisphere uh, portion of the National Security uh, Council staff, et cetera, et cetera. So the bottom line, if you've ever seen how um, concepts that come from leadership work effectively, it's not that everybody is always on the same page, but if you at least force everyone to make a nod to your own PowerPoint slides if from the very you know, upper levels of, of, of leadership, you basically have everyone tracking to your strategic framework. Um, it's imperfect, but it does at least keep everyone at least on the same book, if, if not on the same page. Um, now, there are other things that you also need. You need definitely expanded resources. Um, the amount that we spend on Western Hemisphere is, frankly, a pittance for you know, strengthening governance initiatives. We can do much better. Uh, we need to get the team in place, again, um, getting past the uh, held up uh, ambassadorial appointments and, and the held up of the confirmation of, of, of Ms. Breyer at, the, at Western Hemisphere. Um, and and I, I received no money from Ms. Breyer. I'm just saying this as, as an outside observer. Um, Dialogues with partners, again, making sure that our partners in the region understand the concept and buying uh, this strategic messaging. Um, if we say it's, if we don't say it's about governance and reinforce that it's about governance from the president down and to make it very clear that we're working to build co-prosperity in the, in the region by focusing on transparency, if the assistant secretary says one thing but it's contradicted by the messaging that comes out of the White House, then you're never going to be as effective as you, you could. Um, there are other smaller things that we can, I'll just mention very briefly, um, because I work in DOD, I'll, I'll tell you that, for example, one of the issues is, is the type of engagement uh, funds that, that we have under something that's called Section you know, 333 of, of the uh, um, National Defense Authorization, which is, um, you know, and again, sometimes um, the imperatives for control to make sure that nothing wrong happens with the money uh, prevents us from being able to, to use the monies in an effective, dynamic way, and I suspect the same across many different agencies. And, and frankly, you often get what you measure, and so to the degree that you do not develop effective metrics um, for, um, for, for governance and, and track those metrics to figure out whether you're doing better, that becomes really a vehicle to pushing this forward at, at, at all levels to figure out whether you're actually making this work and, and seeing. Um, so this might have sound very idealistic, and I recognize it's a, it's a very complex problem, but I think it's, it's a vision that even if imperfectly implemented, um, yeah, I really <coughs> am very grateful for the Institute of World Politics for giving me the opportunity to really push that vision out there and that concept out there for um, how these very grave problems that affect the region that is fundamental to our prosperity, that uh, in an imperfect world of imperfect solutions, um, you know, where are some places that we can go to take us in a more positive direction. And again, so thank you very much uh, to the Institute and, and for all of you for, for letting me put that out. And uh, um, I'm uh, open to questions until, uh, um, until our time is up. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I've had a couple of experiences that give me some insight into these things. One is that that uh, early in my working life, uh, I was an assistant counsel in the Office of General Counsel of the Navy Department. And I could, there are various things I could say about that. There was not a high level of legal competence, let us say. Uh, but the, but the, another part of the problem was that the, the contracting officers, when it got to be lunchtime, they would always drop by the office of the of the activity with which the government was contracting and go to lunch with them. Um, and that, that was just, it, I mean, I never did that in my life, but in any case, that was a regular practice. Um, the, and the, uh, but the, and the other thing that, that I, that this is part of, I won't go to, I could go farther in that direction, but also, I sat through the Manafort trial, and um, the Manafort, of course, was getting paid in, in million-dollar sums 
by the Ukraine. And he was putting that money in Cypriot banks. And he was spending it for his lavish and the nouveau riche lifestyle um, by with with by wiring the funds from those Cypriot banks to the people who paid who he paid one of them he paid eighteen thousand dollars for an ostrich skin jacket. Uh, so and he, but meanwhile, of course. Um, Manafort was Trump's campaign manager. Uh, and so you have that. And, and of course, Trump continues to defend him as, and to, to claim he's someone who was abused uh, based on that relation. So uh, I cite these examples about which I know something. I know, I know other examples as well. But in any case, it's this that's part of the, the system in which we live. This is just not something in some, you know, two-bit South American country. No, absolutely, and that's uh, that's probably a, a humbling uh, illustration that uh, to suggest that uh, you know a strategic concept is, is for us to, to work on strengthening governments within the hemisphere. Um, we uh, shouldn't, you know, try to suggest that we ourselves are, are not immune to difficulties in in our own institution because yes, uh, we have many shortcomings of our own, which I think you very eloquently point out. Thank you. And I'm just, uh, I thought, I thought uh, and this was just me reading, uh, I think it was the Senate Cloak uh Twitter feed towards the end of that uh, last week. I thought Mrs. Breyer had been confirmed towards the end of last week. That may have been a, may have been a fake news alert. I wonder if we had a more recent update or. I think, I think it was the, the deal was for justices, not for uh, her and State Department people. Just how I understood it. Correct. Yes. Yeah, I. I Things change in Washington on, on, on a daily basis. As far as I had heard, uh, Ms. Breyer has not yet been confirmed. It was, but, it was an agreement between uh, McConnell and Schumer for a slate of 15 justices, gotcha. but McConnell didn't include in that package any of these political appointees. Thanks for the, thanks for the question. Sure. And just, just, and there's and one other very small point that I'd love to get your reaction to because it's a fascinating vision you're offering. Um, and I was very interested by your mention of Gabriel Carbone making it to the NSC. And I remember his appointment just about a month ago, was it not too not too long ago? Didn't get a lot of attention, yeah. Right, and it revived the uh, the argument of Cuba being a strategic part of the threat that we're that is growing right. out of that as well. And I just would like to get your your take on whether you think this is another um, um, you know paranoid theory and down in Miami by the Cuban Americans or if you do you think there's something to the idea that we would not be seeing the strategic threat, and not just in terms of what's happening in Venezuela, right. their downfall and their problems, the problems to the region and the refugees, to Kukuta that you're mentioning, but also the strategic threat to our security here in this country. Do you really think that uh, you know we wouldn't be facing this threat if it wasn't for Cuba, for the security they sent, the, the secret officers are sending the guy? Because that, that's that's kind of their the private caronas. Uh, that's the argument by the private of the world. They're, they're, they're telling us that you know it, it really starts and, and ends in Cuba. And, right. and if right. it wasn't for Cuba, we wouldn't be seeing what's going on in Venezuela. So, what do you, what do you make of that? No, that's an interesting question. So, so basically, you're, you're asking me to to uh, to to to, uh, to tell you whether as a as a uh, duty employee whether I uh, whether I agree or disagree with the uh, um, senior person for for my region on, on the NSC. Um, my my personal sense is that um, you know, Cuba plays a significant factor, but um, you know there are, are many other factors. Obviously, as I, as I suggested in my in my comments, uh, you know, understanding, for example, why things have played out in Venezuela, you know, as, as they have. I mean, both the you know the personal leadership and, and insights that uh, Fidel and Raúl Castro you know gave to um, to Hugo Chavez, uh, the role of the Cuban DGI in basically you know keeping things together within the Venezuelan military. You know, obviously they have their own you know reasons in terms of, of the um, you know their you know, their, their you know, personal commitment that they don't want the regime to, to default because of their, their you know, personal liabilities and fear of extradition to the United States. But, um, but you know, certainly I think in, in why Venezuela has held together as it has, and, and certainly you know, over the years, um, you know, activities in uh, different groups, if you talk about the you know, Sao Paulo Forum and others, I mean, obviously the, the Cubans have played a 
role in, in many uh, things that have gone on the, on the region. Now the question is, you know, are the Cubans behind, um, you know, every bad thing that has happened any place in, in Latin America um, and fully? Um, I mean, I would, and, and I think that's creating a straw. I mean, I, I don't think that, you know, either, you know, Mr. Cruz or, 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 or you know, or, it, or really anybody takes that. And I, I think beyond that, you also see the, degree to which, I mean, again, if you look at, uh, you know, Mr. Cruz's uh, time on, on the NSC, I mean, I think, although, obviously, he was also very hawkish on, on Cuba, uh, there was, um, but that did not mean that Cuba dominated the, you know, U.S. policy toward the Western Hemisphere. I mean, obviously, you have a, a lot of, uh, of people whose, you know, former lives in, in Cuba have been, you know, forever, you know, truncated, and you have that very, you know, very strong, you know, Miami, you know, Florida community, and, and you know, people who are very influential in, in guiding the administration's, you know, you know, you know policies. But um, I think recognizing the attention that Cuba gets and the importance of, of that is, isn't to say that that our Western Hemisphere policy automatically is going to be dominated by, by, by Cuba. If nothing else, I think it it guides appropriate attention to the fact that there, um, you know, that, that Cuba has played, you know, a role among, among other things. But again, it, it's is it chicken or, or, the, or the egg? I mean, you know, the ability of the Cubans or the Chinese or anybody else to get involved in institutions also depends on the vulnerability of, of those institutions. And, and so, you know, do you, you know, concentrate your strategic concept on blocking or inoculating or, or what combination of both? Um, but so that, that's about the best hedge I can give you on that, that, that very good question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. Um, I do think your presentation at the end is pretty much too optimistic. For one thing, let's say compare how they change to democratic. And I don't know if you imply that's total capitalism. But I think at this moment, Latin America is more toll communism. And there are some fundamental differences probably if the capitalism currently in the United States is a failure, in the France is a failure. Because they don't really pour the justice and fairness. Instead, they are corrupt, and not just government, but also law enforcement, but also the military. So if you combine, you try to think law enforcement and military to help combination with the government effort to help the society, I think that is probably a mistake. Unless the system change. The system currently is not toward the fairness and justice. The system now is toward corruption and militarized, and which people don't agree. Local people and every organization, they don't agree. We should have military to supplement the law enforcement. They don't trust law enforcement to begin with. So I suppose now, Russia, and they want to at least at this moment, and they try to revive and try to, uh, to influence other parts of, of the world, the same as a communist, like the men in China. So I just thought, if men in China, they can really change the system, and I think probably now they try to change and defeat the corruption in some way, but not in the United States, they don't win the swamp. But I think if the Chinese, if they really to revive and the basic on the concept of Confucius, the kind of concept, this really means individual have to sacrifice something, have to toll the society benefit, so they have to have a kind of ethical value. You have to sacrifice something rather than materialism. Mm -hmm. So unless you change that, I think probably you ask that Latin America to change to capitalism probably is difficult because they know the problem mm -hmm. and they know the USA is not going to change it that much at least. So I just thought unless we change both communism and capitalism toward a better value or ethnic value, I think the whole thing will be very optim not optimistic, but pessimism. Thank you. I mean, you raise a lot of good points and some very complex uh, arguments. So let me see if I can at least take on a, a few of those. Uh, so number one, um, I, I cannot say that I'm a 
you know, deeply optimistic person about this. But what I can tell you is, as somebody who has worked for for a number of years uh, in the region, who who really feels a, a deep stake for trying to make the region better. When when I wrestle with what is the most workable approach, you know, I again and again I become convinced at the idea that we need a fundamental strategic concept. Maybe it doesn't fully work, maybe it's complicated, but without an oriented concept of what we're trying to achieve, um, it becomes almost sure that we'll just keep doing little micro programs and that will have partial success and, and sometimes not and the region will 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 continue to, to go where, where it goes. And so the fact that I put this forward does not imply that I'm optimistic, but um, you know to me as I wrestle with it, I become more convinced that if there is a strategic concept which is most workable, it is the concept of, of strengthening governance. Um, the second point that you made about where the region is going ideologically, um, I guess I personally don't define things in terms of communism or, or capitalism. Um, I believe that people in Latin America, like people in the, the United States, look for certain fundamental things and in, in, in values. They want a better life, they, they want economic opportunity, etc. Now, I think in recent years, for example, if you remember at the end of the Cold War and when the historian Francis Fukuyama declared mistakenly that the end of history, you know, all ideological debates had been resolved, um, and you saw across Latin America a number of, of leaders who uh, sold off state goods and, and tried to implement Chicago school style you know, uh, neoliberal policies. Um, and because those policies did not fully resolve the problems of, of the region, uh, later you had different countries that the pendulum swung back. And so um, you had some centrist left projects like, like Lula in Brazil, for example, or Bachelet in Chile or, 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 or others. You had some more populist experiments that rebelled completely against the, um, the, the approach. And so, again, we, we mentioned Hugo Chavez. Um, and I think right now we are in danger of another historical moment where it appears the pendulum is moving in our favor. But... I would say we shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too quickly. Um, when you look at, for example, the rescue of Mauricio Macri, or the, Mauricio Macri in Argentina moving things in a positive direction, but he is in a very delicate position with the IMF. Uh, the return of Piñera in, in, in Chile, again, but um, you know, with uh, some of the social challenges and, and others that Piñera faces, you know, the future in Chile is, is also not certain. Uh, Colombia is in a very delicate moment, and so even Duque being very conservative, returning to Alvaro Alv Uribe's footsteps, um, you know, with you know a million Venezuelan refugees already in Colombia, problems with the FARC, the ELN, other groups. It is not yet certain how that is going to turn out. Um, it's not yet certain for me how the experience of, of AMLO is going to turn out in Mexico and in our relationships there, and so. Um, I guess I don't look at it as so much communism versus capitalism, but you know, the region grasping for solutions, some which are maybe healthier for the region than others. And so I think what I worry about most is taking solutions that do not respect the rule of law, that do not have accountability, because even though not all democratically decided solutions are always good ones. Um, it's generally the case that populist solutions do not turn out well. And so when I, when I look at these, um, these things, I, the question I wrestle with is, how can we help the region to, to better deal with these challenges? And again, so I, I keep coming back to the issue of, 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 of governance. Now, I know I didn't address all of the, the questions that you raised, and there's some philosophical questions you raised about the reconciliation of, of you know, communism and, and capitalism. I, maybe I, I won't go there, but, but I think, for me, the, the important thing is, is how do we work with our partners in the region, um, or at least to be seen as, as partners, to develop better governed regions so that if they go, you know, if they select leaders that try left solutions or right solutions, or if they engage with China or not, that that can occur in a boundary that does not 
cause instability in the region. It does not cause strategic threats for the United States. And so, you know, how do we manage that by being better neighbors in our own interest? So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop at that point, but, but thank you for the very good questions. So Guyana has recently been described to me as a vertically integrated narco state. And going forward with this massive discovery of oil, um, more U.S. private interests are going to be going into the region. So what would you say is the path towards democratic governance and breaking down that integrated narco state into something that's more manageable on this path forward? Sure. Interesting question. And first of all, I'm very happy the, um, the Guyanese Shield states, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, almost never received the attention that they, that, that they should, even, even now with the oil, with the, you know, with the state broke, with, with the Lisa Field. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, my experience in that is, is you know, I, I can't say that I'm entirely objective because I spent six years working at the, at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. And while I was there, um, one of the people who taught our Caribbean security course was a, a very erudite, educated um, uh, uh, Guyanese, uh, retired uh, general by the name of, of Brigadier David, David Granger. Um, and so um, we were all very happy when he got elected to, to be the head of, of, of the government when, when the, uh, basically the, the, the new APN, APNU coalition, you know, with the help of the AFC, you know, came back in power. I think you're right that Guyana has always had problems with state weakness. Um, they have always had problems um, with ethnic politics. Uh, the you know what may be you know twenty billion dollars a year in, in annual oil income that could be coming online in the next two or three years um, you know that's going to supercharge all of, you know, there's nothing there's nothing like pouring a lot of money into a a regime with with weak governance and, and oh by the way that the Chinese are already more than there um, uh, whether whether we're talking about new companies like Bai Shanlin or whether companies you know, like China Harbor or the Shanghai Airport you know contract or whatever. And of course, uh, as, as you know, CNODC is, is actually Exxon's partner in the development of, of, of those fields. Um, having said that, um, I think that in, I think any government would be hard pressed to deal with this. Um, I, I think uh, that uh, Guyana could do much worse than, than President Granger's government just from what I had observed of, of him when I was at the, you know, I was at the Perry Center. Um, but obviously, you know, no leader is perfect nor surrounded by, by, by perfect people. But, but I think, A, the Guyanese Shield region needs to get more attention because we oftentimes you know, overlook it because it neither fits within the Caribbean politics nor it nor fits in our kind of Spanish-speaking world um, you know, of, of what is, you know, South American politics. Um, and it's just across the, the Caribbean, you know, basically, you know, from, from us. Um, in terms of the drug flows, as you're aware, most of the drugs that actually go through uh, Guyana are actually tracking, to the limited extent they are, out of, out of Venezuela going over to Suriname, where they go into the Netherlands to feed the European drug demand. Um, but, but Guyana is still, I, I think, it's an area that needs to get more attention. And, and again, the money coming in makes that a, a, an ever greater you know, concern. So... So hopefully that, that addresses the. You know, it's not a perfect. It's not a perfect solution. But in terms of how you address the the challenges of the impact of drug money in, in general, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I would go back to my my, my fundamental argument about uh, about governance and in all of the sub elements of that, which goes to um, you know using technology and other things to capture uh, corruption. Actually, there was one, and I was wrestling with the one point that I was trying to um, get to with with uh, with the, the question that, that you, ma'am, had, had asked. Um, as I look at Chinese engagement and the role in the fight against corruption, um, one of the things that it's important to recognize is that there's one part of the Chinese that, that is very promising and very dangerous, I think, that we need to watch. And, and that is um, China's uh, increasing pioneering both in China itself and increasingly exporting uh, technological capabilities for security and the fight against corruption. And so um, if you look at places like Xinjiang, where um, it's, it's again pioneered you know, against the Uyghurs, but what China's also begun doing is, is it's integration of cameras with facial recognition um, and the ability to cross-reference databases through artificial intelligence and, and things like that for internal security. But it's also began to export those in smaller projects, for example, ECU 911 in, in, in Ecuador, uh, BOL 110 in Bolivia and in, in other places. And given the difficulties with corruption in, in Latin America, one of the 
opportunities and dangers. Um, there are many ways in which we can fight corruption through the selective use of, of, of technology, uh, identifying patterns of, for example, um, you know, unexplained income by police officers or other government officials through cross-referencing databases, um, you know, following individuals and things. And, and sometimes technology can help to make up for imperfections or the corruptibility of, of, of humans in, in law enforcement. The risk, though, the flip side of that is that um, to the degree to which Chinese finance, Chinese solutions to fighting corruption actually work well, um, the temptation will be for Latin America not only to bring in the good that fight against public corruption, that that makes possible, or public insecurity, um, but also to begin implementing that as a, a fight against political dissidents and, and things like this. I mean, you even find it on a micro level right now with the Sandinistas basically uh, singling out in a crowd who the resistance leaders are and basically, you know, picking them off, you know, one one by one in, in their homes after the uh, after the protest. And so, um, I worry about where technology can take us because I think it can take us. It can help us, but it can also endanger the very liberty that we have at the, at the same time. So. I, we have to manage that affair that carefully. Okay, I think we're a bit over time, so we're going to have to end now. Let's thank Dr. Ellis for joining us. Huh? Thank you all very much.